Thanks, Anne-Marie. Thanks, Mark. And thanks, everyone, for being here this afternoon. As I look around, it looks like almost everyone in this room is old enough to remember an old TV show called What's My Line? Uh, you should remember Bennett Cerf was the host, and the premise of the show was you would have um, a secret guest, and the panelists would be blindfolded, and the panelists would have to ask the secret guest questions, and then eventually guess who the person was. And so, um, really the, the subtext for my presentation today, the, the more official historical sounding one is what halos often hide, a case study of St. Vincent de Paul. The more popular one is, you know, who is this guy? <laughs> who do you say this guy is? Okay. Just, a, just a few facts about Vincent de Paul, because not everyone I'm sure has, the, has a, a great familiarity besides you know, the name recognition. St. Vincent de Paul lived from 1581 to 1660. He was the founder of the Confraternities of Charity in 1617. He founded the Ladies of Charity in 1617. He founded the Congregation of the Mission in 1625. He was the co-founder with St. Louis de Marillac of the Company of Daughters of Charity in 1633. And in 1833, he became the patron of a new lay organization, a new lay organization in the church dedicated to charity, uh, the Society of St. Vincent de Paul, which was founded by Blessed Frederick Ozenam and his companions in Paris. Vincent de Paul was canonized by Clement XII on June 27, 1737, and he is popularly known as the Apostle of Charity. I always believe in defining terms, even if terms seem to be generally known and generally acceptable. So when I begin to talk about what halos hide, we're talking about saints. And so what's the working definition of a saint that underlies this presentation? We, we begin by, of course, reminding ourselves that all the baptized are saints by virtue of our baptism. Throughout salvation history, by a variety of means, the church has identified select men and women whose lives of Christian discipleship were heroic. These men and women are meant to serve as infallible models of the many ways in which human beings cooperating with God's grace can choose to live out their discipleship in the kingdom of God and the communion of saints that surrounds them. I also would like to frame this presentation within this particular context. And that particular context is the reception of Vatican II. As you know, we are in the midst of the 50th anniversary celebration of the various um, major points of the Second Vatican Council course from 1962 to 1965 and CTU and DePaul University has been uh, co-sponsoring a number of wonderful events commemorating and looking at not just the Second Vatican Council but the continuing reception of the Second Vatican Council. Um, I know very often at the university when I'm talking to undergraduates who are 18 to 21 years old I'm very used to things I say to them getting blank you know it's kind of like describing the, the new dinosaur you know, just uh, get the same sort of looks. But the reality is that's the kind of look when I talk to them about the Second Vatican Council. That's not the type of look that I get from you when we talk about the Second Vatican Council. Because as a matter of fact, this 50-year-old event is still in the midst of a very, very active reception process. The church is still coming to grips with the revolutionary um, ecclesiology, the revolutionary shifts in, in Christianity that were occasioned by that auspicious council. We have lived through great changes. We have lived through great conflicts in the church. We see in the new pontificate of Pope Francis a new emphasis on receiving perhaps under-received or underappreciated elements of the Second Vatican Council. Um, and as a historian, this is nothing new. You know, the, the Council of Trent took 150 years for the dust to settle. All right. So we are, in many respects, we're still in the middle of the first part of the settling, if you will, of the reception of the Second Vatican Council. And so I'd like to frame this within particular the decree which took place by Paul VI, then we remember our old friend Paul um, there, the decree on the renewal of religious life, Perfecte Caritatis, which was promulgated on October 28, 1965. And essentially what this decree called for religious communities throughout the church to do was to renew themselves in light of the sign of the times, signs of the proverbial signs of the times, those famous signs of the times that John the 23rd cited as he opened the Second Vatican Council in 1962, to revisit the, who they were, to revisit their charisms, to revisit their founders, and to reinterpret, refound themselves, if you will, according to the needs of modernity, 
um, in light of their founders and their founders' charism. So in many respects, what I'm going to talk about is the ways in which, within the Vincentian tradition, we have attempted to do that over the last 50 years by re-looking at the person of Vincent de Paul and the charism which he gave to the church and indeed to the world. Essentially what I'm going to be talking about is the fruits of my research over the last 30 years. Um, and I can talk about that research for 10 minutes or 10 weeks. Uh, if, you have, if, you're, you know, if, you're, if you're paying tuition at you know, $3,500 a, a quarter, you get, the, you get the full 10 weeks. This is a freebie, so you're going to get the 40-minute 40, 40 uh, 40 minute version. But essentially, what, I've, what I've, my main focus as a historian for the last 30 years is to undertake this task uh, for the benefit of my community, for the benefit of the charism of the, our sister communities, as well as for the benefit of the charism, the essential charism within the modern church and within the modern world. And so for me, the question always goes back to the synoptic question in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And we're all f familiar with the various ways in which that synoptic uh, question is phrased in those Gospels. But that important point at which Jesus turns to the apostles and says, who do people say that I am? And there's no, again, depending on the version, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're this, some say you're that. And Jesus, again, always never sa is satisfied with the answer. He always goes and, and makes it personal. No, who do you say that I am? And, you know, this, this is the whole point. This is the, really the, the, the lens under which I'm approaching Vince DePaul. Who do you say that I am? Uh, and uh, over the, in the course of, 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 of a very, very long history, the Catholic Church has answered that question. In 1737, it canonized Vincent de Paul. So the Catholic Church gave a definitive answer to that by saying, okay, Vincent de Paul, this human person who lived from 1581 to 1660, the Catholic Church has now decided that for all eternity, you get this, wear this adjective in front of your name. Okay? You are now a saint. But again, my point is that that title and everything that that is supposed to, um, to symbolize, that title very often can hide as much as it reveals. And that's what I'd like to do is talk about Vincent de Paul and how that halo over the centuries has at times hidden much more than it's revealed. And how over the last 30 to 50 to 60 to 70 years, within the Vincentian tradition, we have tried to put that title aside, at least for temporarily, and to recapture the Vincent of history, recapture Vincent the person. Vincent de Paul died on September 27, 1660, at our mother house in Paris, at the age of 79 years old. He died as a nationally renowned figure. He died as a nationally renowned figure who was renowned for his personal holiness. He died as a nationally renowned figure as the symbol, finally, of the successful reformation of the church in France. The Catholic Reformation, which of course responds to the Protestant Reformation, the Protestant insights beginning in the beginning of the 16th century, again, is a very, very long process. The church in France is the last major church of the Western church, the Western Catholic churches, to undergo the reforms of the church that the church brings about by the Council of Trent. And so the church that Vincent de Paul was born into the church that he was ordained in was unrecognizable from the church that he saw around him, that people saw around him when he died in 1660. So in his lifetime, the church in France was radically transformed by this Tridentine Reformation. It had reformed itself. It had reformed itself spiritually. It had reformed itself doctrinally. It had reformed its structure. It had reformed its values. It had reformed every aspect of its life. And so the church of Vincent de Paul, when he died in 1660, was all but unrecognizable from the church that he knew as an infant that he was in fact ordained into. And in fact, by the time he died in 1660, Vincent de Paul had become the symbol, the ecclesial symbol of the successful reformation of the French church. Because he had played such a signal role in so many of those reforms, and since so many of those reforms were an obvious success, People saw, even though he wasn't, obviously wasn't personally responsible for all of that, people saw him as the symbol of a reformed church. It saw, his, saw him as a symbol of a revitalized church. It saw him as a symbol of a church that people were proud of. It saw him as a symbol of a church that people believed were now, was now restored to a full spiritual vigor.
So when the Minister Paul died in 1660, his followers and everyone who knew him assumed that this man, who they had heard with their own ears, who they had seen with their own eyes, they assumed that this man who had just died was a saint. Okay. We're all very familiar with the scenes, uh, again, because we all witnessed them, at least on, on television, the scenes at the funeral of Pope John Paul II in Rome. We know that in the midst of that funeral, there were chants among the crowd, Santo Subito, Santo Subito, Santo Subito, make him a saint now. Okay. That, was many of that, that was the same sort of reaction at the death of Vincent de Paul. People were so convinced of his transcendent holiness, so convinced of the model of Christianity that he came to represent, that they, again, they assumed that this man eventually would be canonized by the church. And you have to remember that this is, a, this is a time in church history where the canonization process is very, very different than it is now. John Paul II in 1983 radically transformed the can previous canonization process, which had been in place since Urban VIII in 1622. Previous to the reforms of, of John Paul II, and of course we know that John Paul II, during the course of his long pontificate, beatified and canonized more people than all of his 365 predecessors combined. I'd say that's a radical shift in paradigm. Okay. Now, whether it was the best shift in paradigm is, another, is a debate for another, for another time. But the previous paradigm of sanctity was one that was very, very different. In that previous paradigm of sanctity, the church's presumption was that a candidate was not worthy of being canonized. Because remember, in the end, what the, what the pope would be signifying in this papally controlled process is that this person could infallibly be used as a guide for the Christian life, could infallibly be used by men and women to guide their own values, their own faith, and their own decisions in their life. And so again, it was a process that was ruthless and trying to derail processes. You could derail a, th a process because of a question. You could derail it because of, of a procedural gap. And in fact, remember in the old days, the church's advocate in this process was the famous devil's advocate. It was his job to stop a canonization cause. It was his job to doubt a canonization cause. It was his job to derail a canonization cause. Right. And so the presumption, as in many European legal systems, the pr presumption was you're guilty until proven innocent. And so in this process, which, and again, you could not even begin the process until 50 years after the person's death. And so for the people who believed in the sanctity of Vincent de Paul at the time of his death in 1660, they said, okay, how can we, you know, again, this, these are rules, we have 50 years, we have to wait, what can we do in the meantime? Well, the first thing they needed to do in the meantime was to do a biography of the saint, because the new 1622 um, process really instituted the requirement of a historical account of the person's life of what they did every moment of their lives from the time they were born to the time they died, what they wrote, what they said, what they did, as the basis for the historical judgment as to the heroicity of their Christian virtue. And so with 50 years to work on it, they said the Vincentians, first thing they did is say, okay, we need a biography of Vincent de Paul. And the person that they turned to was Bishop Louis Abilly, who's our, uh, the Episcopal looking character there. Louis Abilly was the perfect person to write Vincent de Paul's biography. For one thing, he was a best-selling theological author already. So if you want somebody to write a biography that people are going to read, who do you do? You get a best-known, a well-respected author. He also had known Vincent de Paul. Okay? Those are the positive aspects. The negative aspect was he was already convinced that Vincent de Paul was a saint. So in the end, what he was going to write was not a biography, but a hagiography. Hey he and everyone else began with the assumption of Vincent de Paul's sanctity, an assumption not based on, again, what they had heard and what they themselves had seen. So it, was based, it wasn't based on nothing. It was based on what they believed and what people around them believed. But as, so beginning with that, that mature man, a holy man in his death at 79, 1660, they said, okay, let's write a biography. So they, they wrote the biography backwards. Right? They wrote the biography beginning with the presumption of sanctity. And so for the second half of Vincent's long life, and remember Vincent lives to be 79 years old at a time when the average life expectancy is 35 for a man. So he's a very, very old man for his day. Um, as a matter of fact, most of his contemporaries by the time of his death were already gone. All the people who knew him, except perhaps for one, who knew him best were dead.
And so the second half of Vincent's life, the public life as a founder of, a religious, of religious communities, his public life as an advisor to kings and queens, his public life as a major force in the nomination of bishops in France, that second half of his life was very, very well documented. And every part of that documentation, again, supported this thesis of a holy man, a holy Christian, a priest of heroic sanctity. The problem was is that once they got, Abley got into the first part of Vincent's life, he started to come to these gaps. Because Vincent de Paul would never, excuse me, would never talk about himself. And there was nobody left who knew him as a young man or as a young priest. There was very little documentation that was left. And so that with this presumption of sanctity, when Louis Abley came to these gaps, he just filled them in. Uh, and, and because, again, part of what he had to do is you had to present a seamless story of sanctity because if you didn't, the first thing the devil's advocate would, would say is, where was he? What was he doing? What was he saying? If you can't tell us where he was, if you can't tell us what he said, if you can't tell us what he was doing, we will presume the worst because the process presumes the worst. And if you can't tell us, then that presumption will overtake your presumption of sanctity and forget the cause. So Abilie, so again, absolutely convinced that Vincent de Paul was a saint, absolutely convinced of, this, of the heroicity of his virtue. When he came to these gaps in the young Vincent's life, in the first half of Vincent's life, he very conveniently filled them in. And, and very, you know, he took the plaster, made sure the plaster was nice and smooth, and sanded it and painted it and whitewashed it, whitewashed it, so it was nice and smooth, so that by the time this image of Vincent de Paul was presented, it was this smooth, seamless story in which Vincent de Paul is a heroic Christian practically from the cradle, <laughs> practically from the womb, to his death. The problem with that, of course, is those gaps. And, a matter of fact, by filling those gaps with hagiography instead of history, from the very beginning, Louis Abilly muddied the waters. And those muddied waters have continued to haunt the Vincentian tradition since that time. Because ultimately, it's very important, who is this Vincent de Paul with the halo has to be the Vincent of history. No, it's not a mythological figure. It was a historical person, a person who lived in a particular place, a person who lived for a particular lifespan, a particular person who was known to have done certain things. All right? This is not canonizing a mythical figure. This is canonizing a historical person. So who was this Vincent de Paul of history? Unfortunately, this, with this, this hagiography, hey once you get that halo, it obscures, that light of the halo obscures many things. And so, and once you get that, history suddenly takes a very, very back seat. All right. We don't have to prove anything about Vincent de Paul. Everything we need to know about Vincent de Paul is told to us by that halo. All right. Now the problem with that, of course, is when the gen when, when this, by the time Vincent de Paul is canonized, 77 years after his death, there is no one still alive who knew him. There is no one still alive who was witnesses to his words. There was no one still alive who were witnesses to his actions. So from that point out, all of this is depending upon the testimony of history or the testimony of hagiography. And so how do we begin to separate these out? My premise is that, especially after his death in 1660, with the biography, history takes a back seat. And certainly after Vincent's canonization in 1737, it takes a decided back seat. So let's begin to, to take this question the synoptic question that Jesus asked the apostles and put it in the mouth of Vincent de Paul. Vincent de Paul asking his disciples, who do you say that I am? Because in essence, it seems to me that was the question that the Second Vatican Council asked all of religious communities. No, and the, the council turned to the Franciscan community and said, who do you say Francis of Assisi is? They turned to the Jesuits. Who do you say Ignatius of Loyola is? They turned to the, the Dominicans. Who do you say Dominic was? To the Benedictines. Who do you say that Benedict was? All right. Recapture that person, recapture that charism, so that you can reinterpret it authentically according to the present challenges of the present time. Unfortunately, by the time the Second Vatican Council, Vincent de Paul had been reduced to a one-dimensional, one decontextualized, mythical, and largely dehumanized saint with diminished power to inspire action. That halo had not only obscured, it had diminished. 
right? And the, the, to give a little evidence of this, when I was a novice 40 years ago, uh, we spent exactly one week on the life of Vincent de Paul in the course of a year, one week. And it wasn't even a full week. In the course of a year's novitiate, we never read one letter of Vincent de Paul. We never read one conference of Vincent de Paul. We never read one biography of Vincent de Paul. We had one person come in and talk for one week about the life and times and the history and who Vincent de Paul was. And I can remember saying to myself, is this all there is? Is this all there is to this guy? You know, I've been, been looking, been used to you know, sitting in all those hours in the Bishop Chapel with little to do but stare at stained glass windows and plaster statues. Uh, there's got to be something more to this man. There's got to be something more to this halo than what I am being presented. Uh, and since I was a historian, I said, well, I'm going to see if there's something more to this saint. I'm going to see if there's something more to who he was than the halo. What also is evidence of this, you know, part of what the council also, the results of this council was that all the religious communities at that point, as part of this revisioning and revisiting of their founders and their founding charisms, had to come up with new constitutions. All right. When the Vincentians began to do that, and we had our first general chapter in 1968, all hell broke loose. Because everyone's saying, well, no, that's not Vincent. Uh, I, I don't recognize that Vincent. You know, someone would say, well, we should do this. Well, that's not who, no, no one who, who Vincent de Paul was. And because we didn't know who Vincent de Paul was, we couldn't say who the Congregation of the Mission was supposed to be in the modern world. All right. And if you can't answer that question, you've got a lot of problems. All right. Luckily, at that point, the historian stepped in and saved the day. <laughs> that's our role in salvation history. <laughs> right, Dick? Right. Okay. <laughs> Because again, what the historians were able to do was to re recapture, to put aside the halo. All right? That halo was a judgment of faith, not a judgment of history. So what a generation of incension historians began to do was say, okay, let's temporarily put aside that halo because that is obscuring more than it is revealing. So let's, de let's separate Vincent de Paul. Let's separate the Vincent of myth from the Vincent of history. Let's separate Vincent the person from Vincent the saint. Let's recontextualize and rediscover Vincent de Paul, not as a 20th century person, but as a 17th century person. All right. Let's recover the role of Louise de Marriac and women in founding the Vincentian tradition. And so that's what historians in the Vincentian tradition have been doing for more than the last 50 years. Reconstructing the Vincent of history. And again, putting aside the saint to concentrate on the person. Beginning with a presumption of humanity rather than a presumption of sanctity concentrating on biography rather than hagiography. No myths, no lies, no legends. No myths, no lies, no legends. If it can't be proved by history, it can't be claimed by history. If it can't be proved and claimed by history, it can't be claimed by the halo or the church. Reclaim his own life, especially in his own words. To let Vincent de Paul, for the first time since his death, speak for himself. Speak through his extant correspondence, speak through his extant documents, speak through his extant conferences. To contextualize him within the 17th century world and the 17th century church. You cannot understand who Vincent de Paul was or who any saint was without understanding them within the context of their life and times, within the context of their church, within the context of their geopolitical realities, within the context of all those realities that come together to create who a person is at a particular time and place. So this is what we as Vincentian historians undertook. The radical deconstruction. Because the first thing we had to do was we had to radically deconstruct the life of Vincent de Paul to get rid of the myths, to get rid of the lies, to get rid of the legends. And most of those myths, most of those lies, and most of those legends were among the most cherished elements of Vincent de Paul's personality. And the way we knew that was because they were commemorated in countless statues, in countless holy cards, in countless stained glass windows. Some of transcendent beauty and some of transcendent ugliness. One of the things we, we Vincentian historians, that we have a contest for the ugliest statue of St. Vincent de Paul that we can find. And there are many, many uh, uh, claimants for the prize. Uh, 
So again, and, and really what, this, this, what, what comes down to is how did Vince DePaul come to be the person he was? All right, that's absolutely, because again, if that's who we as members of his communities are trying to imitate, then it becomes very, very important that we're imitating who he really was and how he really became who he really was through his faith, through his vision, through his values, through his choices. And so part of what we have to do is, is, had to do was to immediately fight this whole thing that Vincent de Paul was a saint from the cradle to the grave. And here we have a very, very pious 19th century French holy card, which depicts Vincent de Paul um, practically uh, just barely being able to walk, being so imbued with the charity that would later make him a saint that he takes um, his father's grain, and it's labeled to Paul, and he gives it away to a, a, a lesser, uh, 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 unfortunate person. All right. And so in this, in this other um, uh, illustration here is at St. Vincent's birthplace outside of Docks in the southwest of France, there's a pilgrimage shrine, and this is over the door of the main chapel. And of course, in Latin, um, this goes to the whole, back to the scriptural thing of who will this child become? And even there, they're saying, okay, this child will become what he started out as. And again, you have a young Vincent de Paul, and again, the myth has him, uh, in this case, it's sharing um, uh, flour with an unfortunate uh, poor person. And in this instance, he is sharing his allowance. Okay? And the, the legend was that he gave 30 sous. Well, again, this is not a, a, a time where there's a lot of cash in the economy, and that a poor peasant laborer a kid would have an allowance from his father to be able to give 30 sous to a, a poor person. Uh, but again, these, these are endur enduring images that we had to deconstruct. And they're more difficult to deconstruct than you would, than you would imagine. Another important piece, in the, and again, it really does have to be a radical, and this is a much more, rad it's, it's very easy to, 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 to disarm the piety of that first image. It's much more difficult to radically de deconstruct um, one of the Vince de Paul's own lies. Okay. Now, the, one of the most famous incidents of the mythic Vincent, as a young priest between 1605 and 1607, Vincent de Paul disappears. He drops out of sight. Two years later, he reappears, uh, and, and I'm, very, I'm simplifying the story. Two years later, he reappears, and he needs something from his patron. And so, you know, if you need something from your patron and you've kind of disappeared for two years, you somehow have to explain your whereabouts. As so Vincent de Paul, the young Vincent de Paul, told this great story of how he had been captured by the Barbary pirates and sold into slavery in Tunis. Okay. And he had just escaped and uh, across the Mediterranean with his last master in a rowboat and was you know, now in Rome and had been you know, received by the Pope, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, these are the first two extant letters of Vincent de Paul. They are written in his, own, in his own hand, and they're lies. They're absolute lies. Okay. Now, by definition, a person who lies is a liar. Okay. By definition, it is difficult to imagine a liar as a saint. Okay. It's difficult to imagine if you, if you have a, a, a skewed view of the way human beings evolve, of what conversion is about. Okay. And so, you know, to, and, and, and again, the, the reason that I as a scholar re reject the veracity of these letters is, again, when I study the conditions, and this was a time of great slavery. This was the time of worldwide slavery. During this era, from the beginning of the 17th century until the French Revolution, the, the Barbary pirates took more than one million Christian slaves. Okay. And this is the same time where you have the great African slavery going to the New World, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the great age of slavery. And this happened all of the time. The Barbary pirates went as far as Iceland, Scotland, and Ireland to take slaves. All right. And so the conditions of this slavery site were very, very well known. But when you examine Vincent de Paul's account of those two years, and you match it with what scholars know of what the life of slaves was like in North Africa, none of it holds together. Just from a chronological perspective, to have go through all of this time in less than two, in less than two years, to have all this happen and be back in Rome and, and let alone going across the Mediterranean in a rowboat. Okay. So, so part of this has to say, okay, it, then, then who is this, who I call Vincent I? Once you take all, and again, these other, these other myths in terms of Vincent substituting himself for a galley convict. convict. Okay. This is one of the most enduring 
uh, legends. But as a matter of fact, it's absolutely impossible for that to happen. A, the, and they were called, a galley convict was a convict because that was the civil penalty for his crime. And so Vincent could not have substituted himself for a galley convict because you can't substitute, you can't take on somebody else's sentence. Uh, but again, but, and, and, part of, uh, and so part of this, this is about, you know, uh, the biographies of Vincent de Paul of Louis Abelie was 1,800 pages. Okay. Um, and even that, two years later, they came up with the Reader's Digest version that went down to 300 pages. But so 300 pages, how, no, what do we do? Well, let's, how, let's go to the comic book version. Let's go to the movie version. Let's go to the TV version. Let's reduce it to symbols. Let's reduce it to dramatic instances, which, you know, what's that disclaimer they put on uh, TV, you know, based on real life events? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's essentially what we come to. And again, that, that what they were trying to do was, again, to, to illustrate holiness that they were convinced of, but by substituting that for real history. And that's very, very dangerous. So part of how do we then, as historians, begin to uh, recover after we deconstruct, because it's one thing to deconstruct, it's another thing to reconstruct. It's not enough to deconstruct the life of Vincent de Paul, because after you take that out, what's left of the first part of his life? You have to reconstruct it and, and, to, to, and to come up with a compelling narrative that explains how Vincent de Paul gets from his birth on April 24, 1581, to becoming that person that he was at his death on September 27, 1660. So one of the lenses of contextualization, recovery, and reconstruction that we as Vincentian historians have used is the reception of the Council of Trent. Vincent de Paul was the last of the great Catholic reformers. Now, beginning with Ignatius of Loyola, beginning with Teresa of Avila, beginning with Philip Neri, yeah, all of the, those great figures of the Catholic Reformation, Vincent de Paul, from my perspective, is the last of the great Catholic reformers. And if you understand him as a, as a church reformer, what was the reform that he was trying to institute? What was the reform that was driving him? It was the reform agenda for the church that had been set out by the brilliance of the Council of Trent. Okay. Not the caricature of, of the Council of Trent, which uh, Vatican II reacted to. You know, there's the famous um, uh, joke about Cardinal Ottaviani at the, first, at the Second Vatican Council, and Ottaviani was, one of, the, was the great, one of the great obstacles in the Curia to the calling of the Second Vatican Council. And the joke at the time of the Second Vatican Council was Ottaviani got into a, a cab and said to the cab driver, take me to the council, and the, and the cab driver drove him to Trent. <laughs> okay. the, the Council of Trent was, was a doctrinally a scripturally, a theologically, a pastorally dynamic and wonderful event. And Vincent de Paul's, everything that Vincent de Paul did as a reformer of the church was within the context of implementing the reforms of the Council of Trent. So if you have to understand Vincent de Paul as a reformer, you have to understand the reception of the Council of Trent, not just in Catholic Europe, but in France. Another lens of contextualization, recovery, and reconstruction is Vincent de Paul in his own words. All right. We have eight volumes of Vincent's correspondence. We have four volumes of his conferences. We have at least two volumes of his writings, uh, of his documents. Another lens is the geopolitical. You know, he was a 17th century, and he lived in Bourbon, France, with his, his old friend and our old friend, Cardinal Richelieu. So part of this, again, all these things that we've, that, that myth, that history had to destroy. But again, it wasn't destruction for the sake of destruction. So who do you say, who do you say that I am? It's who do you say that I am not? All right. So this is what this process of, of historical deconstruction was. We set out to say who Vincent de Paul was not, so that we could then have the positive reconstruction of answering the question, who do you say that I am, and letting the reconstruction begin. So as a result of this, this is the way I would characterize what I would call Vincent I in the first part of his life from 1581 to 1617, and then Vincent II in the second part of his life after his tipping point of his conversion. Vincent I is an average person, an average Christian, an average and unremarkable priest. He sees the priesthood as a job rather than a vocation. He is smart, talented, personable, driven, and personally ambitious. He is self-centered. He cuts ethical corners. 
he's eminently forgettable. Okay. If Vincent de Paul, and so Vincent won, if Vincent had died at the normal life expectancy for a man of his age at 35, he would have been deservedly forgotten by history. And there would be another name above the door at DePaul University. All right? There would be another name on my check. Okay. But he didn't die in 1617. He died in 1660. And somehow in that second part of his life, by that process of ongoing conversion, he became this heroic person, this heroic Christian, this heroic and unforgettable priest, where he saw priesthood as a, 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 as a vocation. He was smart. He was talented, personable, driven, and pastorally ambitious rather than personally ambitious. He was other-centered, and particularly other-centered on the poor, or les miserables. He was values and faith-driven, and all of them, all of those things together, made him unforgettable. This whole point about, about Vincent's, Vincent's conversion. The, the secret to the success of the Tridentine reforms was they were Christocentric. The spiritualities which emerge from the, the Council of Trent are Christocentric. The theology is Christocentric. The scriptural readings are, are Christocentric. And for Vincent de Paul, his conversion, the particular Christ that he was converted to was the Christ that emerges from the Gospel in the Gospel of Luke, especially in chapter 4, verse 18, which of course echoes Isaiah 61.1. Jesus Christ, the evangelizer of the poor, the source and model of all charity. And so Vincent de Paul, going through his conversion, which wasn't a St. Paul-like event, uh, but a, uh, an, an ongoing, uh, lifelong conversion. Vincent de Paul's conversion can be crystallized by a question, what must be done? And that question was asked of Vincent de Paul. He didn't, and to the end of his life, when he was asked about how all of this took place in his life and how all of this led to all the things it led to, Vincent de Paul gave credit to a woman. And that woman was his patron, Madame de Gondi. And Madame de Gondi, as she looked around um, her lands and the lands of her family, was convinced that the church was not well serving the people on her lands. And in fact, that she is a noble woman, she had a, a, an experience where, as a noble woman, she went to confession and the priest was so ignorant that he did not even know the Latin words for absolution. And this struck her, because you know, in, the, in, in the theology then, if you don't say the words right, you don't get the, the, the forgiveness. If you don't get the forgiveness, et cetera, et cetera. And it struck her that she is one of the most powerful, one of the most wealthy women in the kingdom. Even she could not be assured that the church would be able to minister to her. And her solution was she wrote down the Latin words of absolution phonetically, and any time a priest was so ignorant that he couldn't read them, she made him read them off that piece of paper. So as, as she was traveling around, no, finally she looked at all this stuff and she turned to Vincent Paul and she asked the question, what must be done? Here's the, re, here's the ideal that we believe in, the ideal of the kingdom of God, preached by Jesus Christ, the evangelizer of the poor, the source and model of charity, the ideal of the church which has been put forth by the Council of Trent. Here's that ideal and here's the reality that we can see around us. What must be done? And what she meant by that, of course, and this leads to the tipping point, where on January 25th, 1617, Vincent de Paul, in answer to that question, stood up and gave a sermon about healing and forgiveness. Um, and people were so astounded at having someone preach something to them that meant something in their lives, people hung on his every word. People flocked to um, reconciliation after this. And they said, okay, we're on to something here. And so according to Vincent Paul, what must be done? Vincent's answer is the church must be reformed. People who are poor, people who are poor and live at the margins must have the good news proclaimed to them. For Vincent Paul's question, what must be done, was translated. What must I do? What must you do? What must we do? I, you, we must do what Christ would do. In order to do what Christ would do, we must be Christ-like, like Christ, the evangelizer of the poor. I, you, we must be in a constant state of personal and corporate conversion. We must choose to be. In order to do what Christ did, we must be who Christ was. And as Vincent, for himself, and eventually for his communities, looked at the example of Christ, the evangelizer of the poor, as revealed in the Gospels, this is the Christ that Vincent saw, a Christ who is honest, 
a Christ who is reasonable, a Christ who is self-disciplined, hardworking, approachable, loving, faithful, courageous, prayerful. And Vincent's imperative to himself was, this is the person I must be. And this is what he's, his legacy to his communities. These are the communities that we must be. So after 1617, Vincent de Paul spent the rest of his life asking and answering the question, what must be done? And he became a saint by asking and answering this question. And by asking and answering this question, he and his followers came to found the Confraternities of Charity, the Ladies of Charity, the Congregation of the Mission, the Daughters of Charity, and the Vincentian Charism itself within the church and within the world. Again, focusing on the reform of the church and the prefer what later would of course be called by the, Second Vatican, uh, by the reception of the Second Vatican Council, the preferential option of the poor. Vincent de Paul's homilist at his funeral was a bishop, Henri de Maupadutour, and the funeral homily was 47 pages long. <laughs> the only quote you need to remember from that 47 pages is he just about changed the face of the church. Okay. This is a plug for my next book, which will be coming out, in which I <laughs> I've taken the text of, of that and translated it into English for the first time and annotated it. So indeed, understanding what now what Vincent de Paul is, now we can take that halo off the shelf. Now we can put it back on Vincent de Paul's head. Now that we understand the difference between Vincent de Paul, the person, and Vincent de Paul, uh, the saint, now that we understand the difference between the Vincent of myth and the Vincent of history, now that we've recontextualized Vincent de Paul, within the 17th century world and the 17th century church, now that we have recovered the role of Louise de Marillac and women in founding the Vincentian tradition, now we're, we as a community and we as a tradition within the church, we're ready and are ready to ask that Vincentian question at the dawn of the 21st century. What must be done now? What must I do? What must you do? What must we do about reform of the church? What must I do? What must you do? What must we do about the preferential option for the poor. Uh, that's what we, get, what we get when we recover Vincent de Paul, the person, and recover Vincent de Paul, the saint who emerged from that person, and now we can safely put that halo back on his head. Thank you. I'd be happy if anyone has any questions. I'd be happy to try to, to answer them. That's a, it's, a, it's a great question. If you, uh, again, many religious communities in the 1950s, when the new code of, the old new code of canon law was promulgated in 1917, it required that religious orders and communities go back and reframe their constitutions to match new common law. When you look at our 1954 constitutions, which finally did that, when I look at them now, there's absolutely nothing Vincentian about them. Vincent is, just, again, just, it, he's mentioned at the beginning, he's mentioned at the end, and there's no, there's no reflection of his values, his faith, his vision, anything within those constitutions for the Congregation of Mission. When I compare that document with our present constitutions and statutes, which were adopted in 1981, and I compare those to the original rule of the Congregation issued by Vincent in 1658, I can, I can see an alignment. And so I, what has happened within our Congregation is that there has been by rediscovering Vincent de Paul, the real Vincent de Paul, and the real person, and the real saint, we've been able to redefine our congregation. Uh, it's not a question of going back to the 17th century, it's a question of taking those transcendent principles and saying, okay, how, how, do those, how can those principles answer the questions of the 21st century? Vincent found a way for them to answer the questions of the 17th century. If we try to answer the questions of the 17th century, we're gonna go nowhere. Um, hopefully by now the church has learned that. Uh, but so now the, the way we've reframed those is that we fra reframe them in a way in which a congregation stands open to asking and answering the questions of the 21st century within the context of the church, but within a, a context of, again, this idea of the ongoing reform of the church 
and the ongoing w ways in which a church understands what it means to have a preferential option for the poor. So that's now reflected in our Constitution. Now, if you were to, when I go give talks to our novices now, we don't spend one week on Vincent Paul. They, they, the novices spend an entire year reading all of his works, reading his biographies, you know, reflecting on the spirituality, putting that into practice, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's one concrete way in which that's been reinterpreted. Now, the other piece, that, for example, at DePaul University, you know, the largest Catholic university in the United States, there's no category in which Catholics are in a majority, not even among students. And so how can this Vincentian question, which is at, at its root a Christian question, how can that become a highest common denominator for all people of faith, all people of goodwill, to find a highest common denominator, of, especially in terms of, of service to the poor, um, because as you know, the, the Catholic Church and the Christian Church does not have a monopoly on charity, does not have a monopoly on justice, does not have a monopoly on service to the poor or preferential service to the poor. How can we use this highest common denominator, uh, which we need to do in the 21st century, to make the preferential option for the poor, not just a Catholic thing, not just a Vincentian thing, not just a Christian thing, but a Muslim thing and a Jude, uh, 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 something that Judaism can also contribute to. Uh, and, and so that's, that's what the, now that we live in the 21st century, uh, even that, you know, that, that has emerged in a way that we couldn't even think of 30 years ago, but it's here now. And what we've discovered is this new, this recovered understanding of Vincent de Paul gives us the flexibility not just to make it a Christian thing, not just to make it a Catholic thing, but to explore ways in which it can become much broader than that, not only something that we can give, but we can also receive as well from those other traditions. Dick and I had the privilege of two years ago of taking the tours to France and being part of a group that went to the birthplace and the mother house there and to the, the, uh, the home out in the country of the, his patron. I, I guess I was very impressed with his relationship with women and how he really turns to them. Not she was not just a patron; she had an influence far yep. beyond. Uh, and you know, could you speak to that and how he might have differed from the run of the mill clergy at the time of their relationship to women? One of the things that is most striking about the not just the Vincentian aspect of the church reform in France, but the, of, the, of the reform in France itself. Women had a role in the reform of the Catholic Church in France and a role in the foundation of the Vincentian tradition, which was unique in Catholic Europe for, for, a, wide variety, for a wide variety of reasons. Women played a role in that uh, lay women, religious women, all types of women, uh, uh, familial women, were able to play because of the, the, slight, the different way in which French culture looked at women and related to women, they still believed that women were inferior, et cetera, et cetera. But there was an opening within France for a greater role for women that Vincent de Paul immediately understood and went right to the heart of it. Because he said, we cannot reform the church without the role of women. We cannot re, you know, revision charity without women. Um, and, and so he said, since we can't do it without women, we shouldn't do it without women. And so he was able to give women a role in that um, and also the role that women played in forming his own life was extraordinary. Um, so women came to play a role within the Vincentian tradition in the person of Louise de Marriac, in the person of the Ladies of Charity, the Daughters of Charity, that was highly unusual uh, when, when compared to the rest of the Catholic reform and is one of the only enduring uh, contributions of the French element of the Catholic reform, uh, which the church is finally starting to come around to. But, but that was quickly lost. You know, Louise de Marriac, um, who was you know, found with him, Daughters of Charity, you know, his first biography is 1,800 pages. Her first biography is 125. He was canonized 17, uh, 1737. She was canonized 1934. So, you know, that right there, that tells you something about how, um, how, how difficult it was. And part of the recovery of the modern era is to recover exactly, because you can't recover Vincent de Paul without recovering the role, that, the important role that women played in his life, the important role that he played. And I think our, our proto-feminist um, movements to increase the role of women in the church and society. I think we have time for one last question. On that same general topic of uh, women, the uh, <coughs> Daughters of Charity really represented a break with the model in the church of cloistering right. religious women. Right. And they were the first to walk the streets in Paris and to 
serve in a hotel do in, in uh, nursing roles and so forth. And it seems to me that uh, women religious have reached an, a need now for another model because it's, we're not attracting the number of women under the old model. And I would say uh, when you raise the question about what must be done now, I think that is, is one. And I think that uh, Vincent and his courageous attempt to keep these women in, the, in service and not behind the cloister. The Ursulines tried it and they fell, failed. The Vatican wanted it and the parents of these girls wanted it because once they got into the cloister they were out of the will and the, <laughs> they were sort of bought off in a way. And they, um, I think Vincent enlisted the, uh, the royal family too because they saw so much, how much good these women were doing in the pest houses and in all these places in France that they wanted these women to stay on the streets. So they only took vows for a year. They didn't call their novitiates and fishes. They didn't call the women nuns as a way of circumventing canon law. I, I was a daughter of charity for 17 years, so I know a little bit about this too. <laughs> but I think it's really and the time has come again that we yes. need to look at religious life. Right, I, 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 agree with, I agree with that completely. And part of, part of my conviction, personally, it, as a Vincentian historian, and as someone who in the last 30 years has had contact with tens of thousands of young people, um, young people, especially young Catholic people, may not have an interest in the traditional forms of religious life and ministry and service in church that they once had. That does not mean that they don't have an interest in service and vocation in the church. If they're not interested in the forms that we are giving them, well then let's give them new forms. It's not, and again, it's not a comment. It's not a comment about. You know, it has nothing to do about. Uh, just, uh, and, and I'm not saying that the older forms are irrelevant or, or dead. They're going to be much smaller. They're going to be. They're going to be very different. But um, you know, everything we know about the millennial generation, everything we know about Generation X, you know, they're they're not where we where we think they should be. So if they're not where we think they should be, we better go where they are, or they're going to leave us behind. And that's not just the Vincentian community. That's everybody. Great. Well, thanks very much. Thank you.